I am Mabel Rice, and I'm a professor in the Department of Speech Language Hearing here on campus, and I'm also a Distinguished Professor of Advanced Studies, the Merrill Distinguished Professor. The study shows that there may be a single gene that is perhaps one of several genes, but we've identified a candidate gene that would share an influence for both reading development and language acquisition in young children, and the name of this particular gene is KIAA0319, uh, which is located in a particular part of the DNA. So the excitement is that it is a candidate gene for language acquisition, which we have not had defined in this way before, and it is also known to be a candidate gene for reading development as well. It seems to be a bit of a stretch to think there's genes that are controlling how good a child's grammar might be. On the other hand, the grammar is based in a whole host of complicated brain functions. It has to do with the structure of the cortex. It has to do when the central nervous system is really fully mature and ready to go. And that's why the National Institute of Health is very, very interested in this, this kind of work and the story that we're going to be learning more about. We've suspected a genetic component to specific language impairment for quite a while. It runs in families. So if uh, a parent has a history of being a late talker themselves, it's more likely that one of their youngsters will have that, that history as well. So it, it means that we need to be better at identifying which youngsters are likely to be at risk so that we can work with them early on. If we're asking too much of a youngster, if we expect more, then they are ready to be able to do at a particular point in time, and then they don't do it, or they don't grow as quickly as we would like them to, and we wonder if they don't care and they're not motivated, or if their parents aren't caring or their parents aren't motivated, then everybody comes away feeling diminished by that. One of the things we're learning in the longitudinal part of the work that goes on in my lab is how these youngsters change over time. And the good news is that once their language system is up and running, it grows in the same way as other children. So that's the very positive part of the story as well. My lab is very fortunate to be at the University of Kansas. The University of Kansas has a strong history of research in this area. There are many colleagues here who have their own programs of research that's related to the research that I'm talking about. The National Institute of Health provides funding, the National Institute of Deafness and Communicative Disorders. My lab team consists of about 15 to 20 people who work here on campus, and my collaborator is Shelley Smith at the University of Nebraska. She's a geneticist, and another colleague, Javier Gallen, is in Seville, Spain. And there's real value in being part of a community of experts. This reputation has been strong at the University of Kansas for at least 50 years, and we're very, very proud of that collegiality and the accomplishments of this collective group of researchers. It makes a big difference.